here. So without further ado, Mr. Nance, my friend, um, thank you guys for coming out, Recreation 101. This is Different Boats for Different Folks with Greg Nance of the Catawba Riverkeeper. And uh, we're pretty stoked about this one. We've got, we'll get into it uh, in a little bit, but we've got um, as many boats as we can fit into this room as possible. We could maybe fit one or two more, but we're gonna try and talk about pros, cons, um, you know, answer all kinds of questions about all these kind of different boats, hard boats, inflatable boats, stand-up paddle boards, kayaks, whitewater kayaks, touring kayaks, all that stuff. So, um, huge thanks to Recover. We're at Recover HQ. Uh, they're the title sponsor of, of Recreation 101 throughout the series. We're also gonna do a couple giveaways, and we have a few, actually Greg is an ambassador of, uh, of Recover as well, so we've done some cool stuff. Chris is also an ambassador. Uh, Deb's also an ambassador. It's not like, Brian, we may need to get you on board. Uh, but Recover's doing some awesome stuff, 100% recycled um, apparel. And so thank them for hosting us and allowing us to basically build like a little, kind of like a man cave in here, really. It kind of has a, a cool vibe. So anyway, um, let me see here. Also, I don't know if you guys can tell or not. I think somebody maybe won some coffee earlier, one of the earlier um, sessions we had. Black coffee, great for overnight kayak trips. That's right. We, we actually had some coffee on our kayak trip. We'll get into that later. Um, Aquaglide uh, provided a ton of boats here and did a cool feature on Human Power Movement when they were releasing the Cirrus boat, which we'll talk about, um, as well as Sierra Nevada and Guayaki Yerba Mate. So feel free to slurp away. We'll maybe take some, some drink breaks here. Anyway, all right, uh, what do we got next? All right, so uh, I kind of showed a few of you guys earlier. Uh, this photo here is probably... Uh, probably not the ideal use for a kayak. Uh, Greg is the Greg is our our, our expert here, so I'm going to let you kind of give the thumbs up or the thumbs down on that one. Is that kind of the optimal use of a kayak, or not we... optimal? Situational. There, are, there is an appropriate <laughs> venue for it. There you uh, go. I maybe like not that. In that situation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, here's what we're going to talk about. Um, I want to introduce Greg. Kind of talked about a little bit earlier. This guy's a wealth of knowledge. Um, in the, he's just a classic know-it-all waterman. So don't put me to shame here. Most, most of the guests put me to shame when we do this. So hope you, you don't. Um, again, boat selection. I know there's, we've already kind of talked about a couple questions with, with kayaks, uh, even paddles and PFDs, all that kind of stuff. Where do I start? What to consider? Um, transportation, um, maintenance, storage, all that kind of stuff. We're going to kind of literally just use this central area as a show and tell. So we'll kind of, you guys can throw hands on them. Um, and then open, open Q and A, obviously super casual here. So feel free. Chris has already thrown some really weird questions out. Try to keep that to a relatively dull roar, but we'll see what happens. So anyway, and we'll throw out some more raffle prizes, like I said earlier. All right. So special guest, uh, I think most of you guys know, Greg, if you, if you don't, you need to, but, um, engagement manager at Catawba Riverkeeper. Um, this guy literally was out surveying rivers for the uh, 99 miles over the past week. Is Six that days, yeah. Casual, right? Nine like miles. <laughs> pretty uh, casual. Um, also a recover ambassador, uh, which we mentioned earlier, and literally uh, 15 years as a as a river guide, whitewater, flatwater, all kinds of stuff. So we threw Greg's um, email up there. Last thing before I let Greg, uh, if you want to just do a real quick intro, uh, or a little background on you. This actually is a photo of Greg um, on the right, myself, the Ophi looking dude on the left, and then Brandon Jones, who's in the background. He <clears throat> is the, the actual river keeper for the Catawba River Keeper. So he's the kind of the, the, the lead scientist uh, behind keeping the water safe um, and clean and clear and all that kind of stuff. So this was a really cool three day, 75 mile paddle on the Watery River. That's right which is uh, just this beautiful river in um, South Carolina that, I mean, there was gators galore. It was just like, you're in the middle of nowhere. So we, we saw very few people. So anyway, this was a really cool, really cool kind of a three day overnighter we did a couple years back. So um, I think there's actually one of the QR codes. I think I pop a QR code up about the trip recap on this one. So we'll get, 
we'll get to that later. But anyway, Greg, real quick, give me some background on your, literally your, your Waterman experience. Again, right. it's going to put me to shame, but that's fine. Well, no, I got, I'm used to it. I got started with, uh, with, with just rivers as a kid or, uh, you know, tubing or when we were really young, <laughs> our parents wouldn't buy us kayaks and things like that. So, you know, anytime the rivers rose, me and all my friends had skip school for the day and go tubing down the river. Or, uh, and then I started working at the, the Whitewater Center about 16 years ago. And uh, from there, I've worked on various different rivers as a river guide and a kayak instructor. And uh, I like all types of water. Or Like I'm a whitewater guide, but I also enjoy going out to the swamps or uh, paddling flat water, gentle flowing streams, and really just getting people on the water. And, uh, you know, both recreationally and environmentally, you know, if you can get people on the water, it connects them to the river and just makes them care about it more. So, so two things I picked up there. Uh, a, I've already messed up my stats. 16 years, not 15 years. Yeah. Uh, so I need maybe we'll edit that. And counting. Uh, and also, Greg paddled the entirety of the Catawba River. Last year. Last year, yeah. yeah. What, what was the mileage? Uh, ended up being about 315 miles or, uh, because we, we start, I wanted to, it was really important that I started from the true source. So mm -hmm. we had to hike to the source spring uh, where the Catawba leaks out of the mountain. And then we worked our way down about four miles until we could scrape our boats down the river. And, uh, and then from there paddled all the way out to the confluence of the Congaree, which is pretty much right, right there, where that yeah. picture was taken. Or, uh, so, you know, it was a really neat experience. We took the, the drones, the water sampling kits, the cameras, and documented the experience to see firsthand what the current state of the river was. So, so for any, any of the viewers that are not in the Charlotte area, that's the, our, our, our local river basin is this pretty massive river basin, and Greg literally paddled every single inch of it, which I think is, which I think is pretty cool. The main Only channel. the main channel, sorry. Yeah. Working on the tributaries this year. Is that, yeah. is that a continuous <laughs> Or I gave myself a whole year to do section okay. by section because uh, we were documenting it. And I um, also wanted to hit certain sections at certain times of the year mm -hmm. and incorporate some of our programs to show like things that we do or like all, all areas of our mission. Or, uh, so uh, like if we did like a swim guide sampling run or something, I would paddle that section that day. And uh, so it would go from anywhere from the spider lilies tour, or, you know, hitting Lansford Canal during that six week period when they bloom. Uh, and then the next week I might be all the way up in Marion paddling one of the sections of the headwaters or covering, you know, we did Lake Norman in a day. We put in the, we put in at the <laughs> Lake Lookout Dam at 4.30 in the morning and paddled 28 miles across Lake Norman that day. So we'll um, get into what kind of boat would be prefer preferable, yeah. probably not a SUP, so Probably not a pack raft. <laughs> yeah, different boats for, for different sections on that one. And uh, the most optimal boat for each section for us to accomplish what the goal was that day. So that's a good segue. Wow, look at that. All right, so I'm, I'm cheating on my notes here a little bit. So um, things to consider, obviously, we just kind of talked about that, like different, you know, different uh, types of water, right? Slow moving flat water is very different than you know, low class one, two white water. And all that stuff is in our basin. And again, wherever people are watching this, they have different, there's different water all over the place. So those are the type of considerations you need to think about. Um, again, we, we'll talk about this is the transportation, right? Greg rolled up here with a trailer, dragging a bunch of these boats that we'll talk about later. That's not the easiest to, to drive around, to load up, to unload, reload, park, all that kind of stuff, especially when you're getting out into some of these maybe remote places where, you know, put-ins and takeouts and stuff like that. So all that stuff is, is certainly something to consider. Um, we we'll also, I mean, this should be relatively common knowledge, but we'll go over it just because, again, this is Rec 101, but baseline safety stuff. So up here we've kind of got, and I think, I think uh, we'll kind of get a shot of this a little bit later, but like basically like PFD, right? I mean, it, even if we're all experienced paddlers, or if you're an experienced paddler, you still need to have a PF. You never know what's gonna happen, right? There's wildlife interactions. There's, if you're paddling under a power line and you get shocked and go unconscious, you know, whatever it is, if something happens, a boat hits you, that pops you out of the boat and you go unconscious, having a PFD on is obviously pretty critical. Um, I don't know the legalities of it, but be smart about it. Think about that. Um, 
footwear, right? That's another thing that like, we just did kind of a cool little backyard adventure the other day. And uh, in that the takeout, it's not a proper takeout. It's kind of a rudimentary takeout. And we were literally tromping around through the mud. So it's like, well, I literally had um, those Solomon shoes on right there. And that was like my water shoe that I needed. Astral's another, I know you wear Astral's, right? I do. So that's another great water shoe, but you know, you don't know what's underwater. So think about that, obviously. Oh, Crocs? Crocs, that's, <laughs> that is an option, okay. probably not okay. ideal. Um, Greg also has, is that a Garmin inReach? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that's obviously what, you know, Greg's doing some pretty, you know, pretty out there things. And so having a means of communication when there's not cell service and all that kind of stuff is, is certainly pretty critical. Um, I've got a knife on my PFD. You never know when you're going to need to use that. If you're paddling an inflatable, you should probably be careful with that knife. Um, but again, we'll, we'll kind of get into that, some of that stuff later. Yeah. Unless you want to share anything else. Oh, I mean, or, you know, basics on uh, your safety gear for that Garmin. Um, anytime you're in remote areas where you think you might not have service um, or like even in general, they come in handy because if people have their cell phones, they pull them out, drop them in the water. These are at least waterproof. It has a carabiner to attach. You can call for help. You can send text messages. You can also, especially if you're in a, like a cypress swamp or something like that and you get lost, you can find your way back to your car by just searching on your, your Garmin. Um, and your knives too, they are you know sharp objects or so with your inflatables, but most of those like white water grade knives or knives come with a blunt tip to prevent things like that. I was gonna ask like yeah. um, most dive knives have a blunt tip. Yeah, so or that one may have one. The majority, like the one I was gonna bring like my rescue PFD in. There's a few different types of PFDs. That's not a blunt tip. No, that, that's <laughs> not. But or um, it it's still got a cover on it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So as long as you're away from your inflatable, or um, but different types of PFDs. You know, there's some that are a little bit lighter weight, have mesh backs for if you're out in an open body of water where the sun's beating down on you. And uh, then your heavier duty, like you can see the, the levels of the PFDs on, usually on the back or the inside of one of the chest plates or what the Coast Guard rates them at. So it's just important that you match those ratings with whatever type of water that you're on for the day. And your whitewater PFDs, you know, they'll, they'll have a lighter weight version all the way up to what we consider a rescue vest. And if you're going to get one of those like astral green jackets or a rescue vest, you want to, in order to know how to use them properly, if you're going to go into that realm, you, you should go ahead and take like a swift water rescue class so you understand how to use the rescue ring and your, your release like harness and stuff like that. Um, so, quick, quick question while yeah. I'm on PFDs, let me throw this out there. Um, state regulations or just safety regulations, is it required in the boat or on? So the law, just... the law states that you have to have a PFD in your boat and you don't have to wear it but I would strongly recommend that you always wear your PFD because it's not doing anything if you were to have an incident and it's not on you. Or a lot of the times if you're coming out of your boat, you're getting separated from your boat or your gear, or getting swamped or something like that. Or, um, so, you know, if you're out there on a hot day or something, like I said, they do have those lighter weight with strategically placed flotation areas so you can, they're breathable, you can still be comfortable on the water. Uh, while still being safe. Yeah, it doesn't do any work, any any uh, help if it's yeah. floating down the river and yeah. so are you. I would always recommend wearing it. Is that what we're looking at here with this? The, well, this, so. this, is a, this is primarily for like stand-up paddle boarding. So it's a waist, yeah. uh, it goes around your waist here. Um, partially for more maneuverability as you're paddling, but also when you, when you pull this cord and inflate it, you kind of wrap it around your, your neck. Okay. So it kind of, it gets much bigger. So you, like an airplane. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And it's got the, literally like the little blow tube. You can inflate it, you know, self-inflate it too. So it's got a uh, CO2 thing that will self-inflate. I like that too, because it's at least attached to you. Mm -hmm. So right. yep. you don't lose it. Right. Whereas if you Just take your PFD off and put it in the back of your boat, yep. you become separated. Yep. Sweet. All right. Um, well, so let's get into uh, the boats. We've got seven different paddle craft here because some are boats and some are boards and all that kind of stuff so we'll, we'll kind of run through uh, we'll alternate here a little bit mm -hmm. um, you guys that are here as well as the viewers will very clearly learn that I am more on the recreational side uh, and, and Greg is certainly more on the 
he gets into more action than I do. So, um, but first boat we have is, uh, this is the Aquaglide Cirrus. So this is literally a brand new boat that came out this year. Um, we put the QR codes up here. The Cirrus info is up there. There's also, and ironically, the other QR code on the right side here is a video uh, that Aquaglide uh, put out. And it's actually a video that they kind of highlighted human power movement. And I feel weird saying it, but it was it was like a story on me and my whole like way of that I like to adventure. I like to adventure with, you know, all day kind of alpine lake paddles. I also like to take the kids out after school on a random Tuesday. So um, when they were developing this boat, this boat is very diverse as far as um, uses, different ways you can use it. Um, the Cirrus name call, comes from like obviously Cirrus Clouds because it is their ultra light kayak, right? So there's a huge trend in the paddling world uh, for packable watercraft. And we'll get into that too with a pack raft here a little bit later. We all know about, you know, inflatable stand up paddle boards versus hard paddle boards. We'll get into that. So this is Aquaglide's kind of first foray into an ultra light packable kayak. Um, what that means is all the, like the material is, it's, it's lighter, it's thinner, it's, um, and it's not as durable as some other boats, right? So like this boat, you're not going to be able to be paddling, you know, white water and going through rocky areas and all that kind of stuff. But what you can do is you can literally pack this thing up, literally throw it over your shoulder, walk down to some random, you know, um, you know, makeshift kayak put in that you couldn't otherwise do with a hard boat. So, um, Again, feel free to check it out. There's three different chambers on this. The floor is a separate chamber all the way through the bottom. Um, what I do to fill this thing up is they have a floor pump. And this is pretty consistent in, in the inflatable world, but um, a floor pump. And then also this happens to be a Coca Pelli, but this is a feather light. So literally this is just kind of as it goes. This will inflate very quickly. So what I do is I, I inflate that multiple times. What's the charge rate? On that? Yeah, I forget exactly what it is. We could look it up, but it's something like you can probably get for this is a Coca Pelli, so for pack rafts and stuff, I think you can get something like thirty fills out of each charge on this. So, so it's filled four with that in one shot. Yeah, like we filled up a bunch of these. Um, when we get into the pack raft, like this is what we took to Alaska when we did that pack rafting trip. We had a few of these, and we also had a floor pump. And for, I think we were out there, there was five of us for seven days. And um, we had a couple of these, but it basically charged, or it basically filled the entire trip. We had, we had some battery, uh, mobile battery packs that we took with us as well. But this is just a really nice to have, like if you do get an inflatable. I mean, the floor pump works perfectly as well. It's just, you know, you just, you, this is your warm up <laughs> before you start paddling. This just kind of makes it a little bit easier. But, um, Super simple. This one has a, uh, a, a, a tracking fin on the bottom. Um, some of the, I'm trying to think, yes, yeah, some boats will, some boats will not. Um, but again, you know, it's got some storage here, but it's an open, open cockpit. Um, you can put, you know, store stuff under the bungee, whatever you may need. This boat is best for, um, Slow moving rivers, again, this is not like a whitewater boat. This is not, you know, it's a little, like I said, a little less durable than, you know, going crashing through pretty aggressive rapids and stuff like that. Um, I have taken for the local folks on the South Fork, and Greg knows this better than anyone else, but I took this on that really cool stretch from Spencer Mountain down to the boathouse, mm -hmm. which is rocky. It's a little bit- um, Class one and two. Mm -hmm. It's good. And so it handled decently on that. It's not what it's built for, but it can handle some, it, you can get into a little bit of action with it. Main feature is it's way more packable. All this is inflatable, the seat's inflatable, adjustable, all that kind of stuff. You, when, we, when we're gonna talk about some other ones, pro of this is, you know, we can pack it down to probably the, literally the size of that um, Sierra Nevada cooler there. Like pack it all the way down, throw it over your shoulder. I actually did a, a little multi-sport day on this where I threw it in a backpack. So I packed it all up, threw in the backpack, just had the, the paddle blade sticking out and was able to ride my bike to the kayak put in. So that's the, that's the pro of this boat is it's way more packable, way lighter. The, let me check the pounds. Yeah, 
So up here you say it's 11 feet long and 15 pounds all in. So really not, you know, super light, super easy to, to, um, uh, to move around. And um, so is it durable enough to hold your bike on it if you wanted to pack your bike on it? I, I've, I've not so done, you you yeah, I've not done that with that. When we did that one, we locked up the bikes at the, at the put-in. Um, I've not bike packed. I wouldn't recommend I mean, it depends on what you're doing, right? It depends on what type of venture right. you want and what type of gear you have access to. I, if I'm gonna do a, a true bike rafting or a bike paddle, then I would probably use the, the Cocopelli um, that we'll get into the pack raft. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, you probably could, I wouldn't do it on like a mountain bike or anything like that. If you've got a lighter road bike and you know you're just literally ferrying across some water and you're not really gonna be splashing around and stuff then you could absolutely do it on here. There's not a huge, like this kayak's a little bit thinner uh, versus some of the other things we have. So like that's something, that's a consideration to keep in mind too. It's just, especially with me, I'm taller, so I've got a, a bigger bike. Um, so just spaces could be a little bit of an issue. But if you were, if you needed to just literally scoot across a, or scoot across a little flat water section, you could absolutely throw the bike on there and, and you know, pack it back up and keep going. So yeah, actually, that's a good, that's a good idea. Maybe I need to. <laughs> Only one need way to think about out. that. Yeah, right. It's doable. Just uh, an element of yeah. risk. Um, any questions on this? Again, we got a lot of boats to go through, but any questions on this? Good. Rock and roll. Perfect. All right, Mr. Greg, I'll let you. Here, I'm gonna move. I'll move this out of the way. What's our next boat? What's our next boat? We've got. Ooh, the fluid. Start with the fluid. Yes. Let me get this out of the way here. Yeah. I'll let you grab the front. We'll probably go, yeah, let's go back in the hallway there. It's going to be like our... This, this boat, it's a Fluid Chimani. So Fluid is a company based out of South Africa. Um, the local distributor lives in uh, Fort Mill. His name's Rod, Rod Hunter. Or, um, but basically, this is a, a sit-on-top kayak. So it's the, the most beginner-friendly boat, I feel like, that's out there. Um, some, one of the one of the big pros is that with a with a sit-in kayak, if you were to tip over, it swamps your boat and fills up with gallons and gallons of water. So it adds an element to you getting back in your kayak to continue your journey, or because you got to swim the boat to shore, get all the water out of it. Whereas a sit-on-top kayak, if you were to have that out-of-boat experience, all you got to do is flip it back over and dive back on top. Um, you know. Different models will have different features. I chose this boat specifically because it's really stable. Uh, it's got a, a wide area around where, where you sit. That's where the majority of your stability in the boat comes from. Um, it's also got these nice adjustable foot pegs that you can slide up and down depending on how tall you are. Um, it's got a strap that goes right here for your water bottle. Um, it's got a dry storage compartment in between your legs. And another one, and this is like for your things that you might need off the bat are your snacks, sunscreen, things like that. And then the back storage area is more for, you know, if you've got food for dinner that night or if you're doing an overnight trip, you know, this still allows you to have that overnight experience uh, with these, the storage areas on the front uh, that you would put like your dry bags with your sleeping bags and stuff like that, or an area in the back where you can put more gear and use these, uh, these D-rings to uh, strap additional gear on there. Um, this is just the most beginner-friendly type of kayak that you can that you can buy. Or, um, so Greg, know, like most most, if there's just a kayak rental place wherever, most of the kayak rental outfitters are going to have something like this. Yeah, most right, there like there a sit-on top. There, there's a few that don't, but most are going to have a sit-on top version. Like Perception Tribes are really popular. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackson makes a nice sit-on top kayak with a built-in seat to it, a built-in plastic seat with a with a higher back. Um, if you're getting your own personal boat, I really there's <clears throat> you know some fancier versions of these that'll give you really good back support, nice cushions in the seat, so it just makes your overall experience more comfortable. Um, they also have 
I like these because they have mm -hmm. these nice, like, built into the design handles. So they're good for running straps through. You mean you don't want to just lift this up from yeah, here? Yeah, right? you know, yeah. these are these over time, you have to replace your bungees. They uh, dry rot when they get wet and they're in the sun or they start to become loose. So you have to replace them pretty, or say every two years or so. And um, I really like that it also has the handles over here too. Mm -hmm. So you can also carry them on their side. Um, so, you know, and this is also that uh, high impact plastic. Or, um, so depending on what type, these are kind of built to still go through those class one, two environments and hit a bunch of rocks. Or, um, whereas some boats, you can tell when you pick them up, like if you can push the bottom of them in, it means it's like a, a, a more, a, or a less durable plastic. Mm. So more likely to get a hole or a crack in it whenever you take them on those rivers where these are specifically made to take that abuse or, um, and things that are, might be out of your control as a beginner. Like you might not be able to avoid that rock and you hit it with this boat, you can keep going. Whereas you knock a hole in your boat and it changes the whole day yeah. or on some other boats. <laughs> so those are just a few things to look for whenever you're considering like your first kayak and a sit on top version. Um, a few things to keep in mind, your body's exposed to the elements or um, so like your legs, thighs, things you wouldn't think of when you're sitting inside of a kayak. So you just have to make sure you either wear clothing that covers your legs or apply plenty of sunscreen because that's the most common things I see is people uh, frying their knees and thighs and things like that on some old times. I'm literally, my, my shins are peeling from that exact, <laughs> so, that's a whole, that's a whole nother, uh, Whole another you know, story though. <laughs> going to the beach is kind of boat I want to on the beach in the ocean, right? As well. Yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, as long as you protect your skin and stuff like that, you're going to get splashed. So if it's a cold day, you want to dress accordingly to make sure you have splash gear on and things like that to break the wind if you're getting wet. Or, um, but if you're in an environment where flipping over is likely, especially in an open body of water like a lake where it would be a long swim to shore to empty your boat or uh, sit on tops are awesome because you just mm. flip them back over and climb back in them and then you're good to go. Versus sitting in a bucket of water if yeah. it's like a sit-in kayak. Because you yeah. lose all yeah. control of your boat when it's swamped or, yeah. and it doesn't move, it doesn't turn, it's more tippy again so you're more likely to flip back over when it's full of water. What uh, guesstimate a little bit, what is it something like that way? Uh, well think, this is yeah. a pretty stout boat or um, I would say this is more in like the 40 mm. Or uh, like that 45 to 50 pound range. Yeah. So just for context, right? That's yeah. a, the pro is way more durable than the inflatable, but yep. the con is, yeah, now you're, now you're 40 pounds yep. versus way less packable. Pounds. Yeah. You got to consider how easy is this going to be to put on the roof of your car? Mm -hmm. Or uh, do you have, you know, do you have two people on this trip to help carry the boats? How far is the, you know, the launch from my vehicle? Mm -hmm. And should I get a set of wheels to put underneath it? Or because that's the good thing about these these top end storage spots too is you can you know roll the boat down to the launch and then pop your wheels back on the back of it and then paddle throughout the day and yeah, work smart not hard yeah <laughs> cool. how about maneuverability how is those boats about a 10 footer uh yeah or it's maybe a little longer than 10 feet or um but it's it's great for maneuverability um, you know, it wouldn't steer as, or it won't turn as quickly as like your flat bottom boats with, with uh, like no, no V shape or keel to the bottom of them. Um, but it still has uh, these, these two skegs or built in skegs on the bottom okay. or to help them track in a straight line. And it makes it not, and this rocker right here also allows you to ride over the top of like waves and things like that a little easier. Uh, so it still steers. I'd give it like medium steering and uh, like also medium tracking. Or so it's not going to be the top end of either specific boat that's made to do those types of things, but it's Super a perfect in the middle. The beginner. Yeah. 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 Be able to keep a straight line rather than. Yep. And may, may have to work a little harder to steer on a dime, but you know, it'll, it'll get the job done. And if they do mess up that additional stability, will get them through something where they might not have otherwise in a different type of boat. Well, and we'll go into this a little bit when we do, um, when we talk about the whitewater boat, but obviously like these categories are pretty broad, right? So like this boat is not meant to be a specialist for this exact specific type of paddling or this type of water. It's to kind of have a broad 
you know, range of use yes, in the same way that whitewater spectrum. boats do. Yeah, it's exactly. great for flat water. It's great for gentle flowing streams yep. all the way up to like class one and two. And um, if you're going either other direction, like I'm doing long distance flat water, I'd branch more into that touring. If I'm mm -hmm. doing rougher water, I'd branch more into that white water. But this is a nice central beginner boat. These are great for paddling safety with swimmers. Yep. Mm -hmm. hmm. You've done that before? <laughs> uh, that's, that's just because uh, Jim probably needs like all that nutrition and he needs, you know, he, he, he has all this baggage he's got to bring with him. People that have had to hang on to my boat. <laughs> right, so. all right. Jim's not sure lunch. All right, um, let's pop this boat out here and then we'll, uh, the next one is the pack raft. All right, yeah, I'll grab, good. You got it? Yep. All right, so next one up here, y'all can see, I think we'll probably flip to the, um, um, to, the, to the presentation slide here for those watching at home, but this is the um, Cocapelli Nirvana. This particular model is uh, the one that includes, you can get them with and without the spray deck. So kind of what Greg was talking about before is that that sit on top kayak was exposed. Um, this has a spray deck. This actually comes with a skirt as well. Um, so this boat is, um, again, it's a, it's a pack raft, right? So it's highly packable. You can kind of see some of the stats up here, extremely packable, seven and a half feet long. So it's a, it's a shorter boat. Um, and literally it's under 11 pounds. So this boat is, um, this boat is a little bit more specific to like that, that recreational boat is kind of like a broad, you know, spectrum of uses. This boat is a little bit more, well, very more specific to, highly packable, transportable, and then also this boat is particularly focused on uh, running white water. So same thing, there's really no rudder, there's no skag, there's really nothing here. The, the tracking ability on this boat is nowhere close to what you'd find on a touring kayak or you know, some, other, some other boats that we'll talk about. There's no fin, there's nothing like that. So you miss some of that maneuverability with it, but what you gain is Literally in, in the background of this picture, you can see that's in um, Gates of the Arctic National Park. We did a seven day pack raft trip that we mentioned earlier. And we were into literally class two and three stuff, but we were also into water that was trickling at, you know, four inches deep, right? And so we were able to literally just paddle through all that stuff in this same type of boat. So, um, you know, we'll do, we'll do the pros and cons, right? Pro is, what I just said, you can paddle, you know, class two, three, four, or five, whatever. I mean, I'm not a class five paddler, but you can get into that stuff with this type of boat. Um, but you can also literally be paddling along, you know, in, in literally just, you know, inches of water. Um, did another pack rafting trip in um, Arkansas on the Buffalo River. And that was, um, you know, there's some rocky shoals and stuff like that, but just super wide and super, uh, super shallow. So this boat was perfect for that. We could kind of, we only had to get out once or twice and walk, but this boat was perfect for that. Um, easy to travel with, you literally just, you know, that adventure we did the other day, same thing, we threw this in, the, in a backpack and, you know, rode, rode our bikes all the way to, um, to the kayak put in. This particular boat, um, since it does have the spray deck, I've done some, I've thrown the bike on there. Brian, that was one of your questions earlier. With the spray deck, that limits you a little bit. Like, if it doesn't have the spray deck, this whole kind of cockpit's open. So that allows, you know, if pedals down, all that kind of stuff, it allows more space. Also at, like I said, seven and a half feet long, you're not dealing with a ton of space on this, right? Again, I'm taller, I'm six, you know, four or whatever it is. And so I can fit in this thing. My feet are all the way up to the front, but I don't have a ton of space to like put a whole bunch of more gear, equipment, bikes, all that stuff. Um, this model is really cool. And we can actually kind of like, Maybe we'll pop this open and show you, but this is, obviously you can see this kind of, it's called a T-zip. This is literally, if we rip this open, obviously all the air would come out, but these are storage chambers, right? So again, when we did the Alaska trip, it was perfect because I had, um, I had a pack up here of stuff that I needed to get to during the day. And then in here, I had all my stuff I only needed at nighttime. So my sleep system, cooking system, all that stuff was in here. So, you know, 
So you stuff that in the raft first and yep. then inflate it? Correct, exactly. So that is yep. actually, a, I was going to ask if that was a storage compartment, it is. and it is. Yep, yep. But so. if you tried to get it right now, you would sink. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where, yeah. So using this bill, you got to think about it, like, all right, this is, that's the last Don't thing you do. Stuff there. everything in. Yeah. <laughs> stuff. Oh, I forgot my water filter in there. Well, too bad. You don't have your water filter until you're ready to, you know, until you're ready to deflate. See that John water the roof. Yeah. You're hoping your buddy has his water filter out, outside of the, uh, uh, outside of the boat. So, um, Brian, I'm going to, I'm going to pop this open. Yeah. I think it'd be cool just to kind of get a shot of this. So, Again, this is a single chamber here. Um, before I do, I'm trying to think of any other questions on this thing. I mean, super fun boat. This also, they actually, um, real quick before we do that, they actually just came out with a, forget the name of the boat, but it's a 1.5. So it's a longer version of it. And that is specifically uh, meant for bike packing or bike rafting. So basically that just gives you a lot more space up front for gear, bikes, all that kind of stuff. So quick question. Yeah. You've shown three boats so far. Yeah. Which of the three would you take on the 28 mile journey across Lake Norman? The touring kayak. Yeah. Or, not, or neither one of the three that we've shown. Yeah, <laughs> not yet, not yet. Probably the, probably the best one for that of the three we've shown so far is the, the Sirius Ultralight. The Ultralight. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. This one, hell no. Absolutely right. not. This really would be hooked because it, yeah, it, it doesn't track. It doesn't cut water. It's not built for speed. It's built for moving water. Yeah, it's built. It's built for dealing with all kinds of different varieties. But it's not a specialist. Like if you're going to paddle 28 miles of flat water, you want something where you're, you know, streamlined. You're cutting water fast. You're you're just going for speed. This is not built for for speed. This is built for. I'd say they're almost built more for multi-sport or mm -hmm. like when you've got long hikes or long portages you know, you're, you're mixing elements to your trip or, uh, cause these are packable. You mm -hmm. can carry them in and go on a beautiful hike and then end at a river put in and then paddle back to your car or, uh, and pack your bike on there. The, the mountain bike trail. Yeah. Exactly. You know, this is yep. a, a very universal, like to, to do really that. unique trips. Yeah. All right. So Brian, I'm going to pull this just so you guys can kind of see it here, but again, single chamber, you can actually fit. I don't know what the volume of this is inside, but it's an, it's amazing. I had a 50 liter duffel that I shoved in there every day. Like I said, camp chair, everything that was there, sleeping gear. I actually had my um, camp shoes and, and all kinds of stuff in here. So it was pretty, it was pretty impressive. Um, before you def before you pull that, it's best to deflate a little bit, just so you're kind of releasing some of the tension. So that's just kind of going on this piece right here. You're pretty your your typical nozzle there. Perfect. Just to release some of that pressure. And then at that stage, you're ready to go. And it's kind of literally just kind of ripping the bandaid off. So you're. And there you go. Oh, wow. So it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of wild. Yeah. So that's a, that's a massive space. So again, if you're doing that multi-day stuff, this is a great, great boat for paddling, packing up, hiking over a pass, inflating it back up going again so pretty pretty cool boat again it, you, you can tell obviously each boat is made for a specific purpose in the same way that a running shoe right running shoe well this is for you know mountain running this is for trail running this is for track running this is for long distance running this is for sprinting same kind of thing with boats so so when using the internal storage mm -hmm. do you have to worry about how it's weighted yes yeah and how much you're like is there is there a and this might be in the user guide or the stuff that comes when you purchase something like this or look online. Is there a maximum load? There, there probably is. Um, I put the QR code for this specific boat up here so we can. I mean, obviously, uh, if you're doing something like this, you're not packing like my, my metal, you know, my kettlebells. Yeah, yeah, you're going hyper light. You're, you're packing things that are yep. extremely functional for what you're doing. So let me show this. I'm trying to show you here. This is the back of someone's pack. This is, this is my, that's this boat right here. So you can kind of barely see on the front. I had my um, 34 liter kind of day pack from Hyperlight Mountain Gear. That had all the stuff that I needed for out, throughout the day. That was on the front of the boat, which allowed me to stuff all the other stuff I needed just at night in the back of the boat. So those I mean, kind of counterbalance there. each other. I mean, it, in that picture, you can tell it. They're, I mean, they're all flow. I mean, they're not like 
half floating. They're all floating. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, this is where the, we were on. This is right before we put in uh, the second time or whatever. So we're there's there's maybe like two or three inches of water here. We're just I mean, kind of like staged and stuff. Boats but... waited with whatever's inside of them. They're not like sitting low in the. Water, oh right, yeah. The they water. they sit up high. And there is a ton of buoyancy in that. So the downside is if you can again you probably can't see way back here, but this blue boat is the their Cocopelli's Recon. That does not have that T zip. Doesn't have the storage inside. So he had to put everything on top, which all that buoyancy, all that weight on top, he was a little bit more top heavy. And so we had a few, uh, what'd you call it? Out of, out out of, of boat, boat experiences. experiences. I saw that. Oh, <laughs> we man. had a few, yeah. yeah. Greg, Greg, knows, Greg knows Wes. Wes is a, a, a big, huge fan, fan of human power movement. But Wes experienced a few out of boat experiences. And part of that was because he had all the stuff on top. He, didn't, he wasn't able to yeah, kind of counterbalance it. Being yeah. top heavy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. So swimming around in the Arctic water was not ideal, but uh, we had dry suits on and stuff. So we were, so, well, one guy that fell in did not have a dry suit, but he's fine. All right. Let's see, Greg, what do we got next? The are scorch. Are we going to the whitewater boat? Yeah. Boat or whitewater boat? Uh, both. Ooh, it's a whitewater creek good boat. question. Okay. All right. I'll give you both of these. So I, I always assumed a creek boat had a keel to it. Hang on, before I give you, you all notice that Greg's paddles actually look like used and like, you know, legit. My paddles are, my paddles look too nice. They're not dirty enough yet. Greg this actually the, knows what he's doing, I don't. This is the least don't. busted boat I have. <laughs> how many, how many, uh, how many boats do you personally own? Uh, kayaks, about 12, three rafts, a <laughs> couple canoes. Three yeah. rafts, a couple canoes. Yeah. Unreal. No cars in our garage. <laughs> or, um, but yeah, yeah I, I, one of the Love reasons it. I brought this boat is because it's the, the most universal whitewater kayak. There's a lot of different uh, specialized boats that the, the features on them or make, it, make you able to do certain things on the river or make them more compatible to certain types of rivers. But the creek boat will still get you invited on all the trips. Or <laughs> you know, this is, Which is important. Yeah, you know, and technically you can paddle it in flat water. Or, so if you could only buy one boat and you're interested in whitewater, I feel like this is the ultimate boat that can paddle anything from flat water to send in big waterfalls. Or, um, so the, the creek boat, you notice you know, it's got a flat bottom. Or, uh, so that's the, the major disadvantage to flat water is you are the tracking system or with your paddle. Uh, if I'm paddling along and I take my paddle out of the water, then my boat's just gonna spin in a circle. Uh, there's no tracking on it, but the advantage to that is it makes it super maneuverable in moving currents and makes it to where you can turn on a dime, you know, paddle back up the river, catch, or I'll try not to get too much into whitewater lingo because uh, it starts sounding like a different language. Or, um, but, but, that's, but that's similar to the pack raft too, right? There's no flat bottom boat where that maneuverability where you can make a quick move. Yeah. You have that option, but you don't, you're not able to just paddle straight down a flat water stretch. Yep. So and, yeah, that's and a, a disadvantage. A lot of the times, you know, even if we are on flat water stretches and I'm guiding a program or something like that, I'll still bring a boat like this just because it makes it to where I can get to people quicker that might need a hand with something. Hmm. And I can still usually like hang with the other boats. Or, um, but you know, these boats are super durable. Or, uh, all white water boats usually are. They got that high impact plastic. They're built to hit rocks. Um, the, the interior, you know, these handles too, all these handles have different purposes, not only for being able to carry the boats, uh, but also in strapping also the boats on up. vehicles or, uh, or trailers and also for rescue scenarios too. Like if you come out of your boat, fills up with water, gets lodged on rocks and you've got to figure out how to get your boat out. You've got all these different options to connect to, to get mechanical advantages and get your boats unpinned. Um, you know, the interior is going to be a lot more built for, or you find, find that you're more comfortable in these when you're not comfortable. Like you want to be really <laughs> tight inside of your boat or, uh, because you want it to take the place of your lower body. You know, like, just like you can use your legs when you cinch yourself down real tight inside of these boats, then you're able to twist your body and maneuver it just like you would your legs. Um, so you've got adjustable uh, bolt or foot peg or like a foot area down here where you can pull it closer to you. You've got these ratchet systems for your uh, back bands to 
make sure you're sitting up straight, you have good posture in your boat, or um, the back end of the boat. Um, they also have these foam bulkheads on the insides of the boat, and that's just to keep them from collapsing under extreme pressure, depending on what grade of water that you're paddling. Um, you know, you've got areas back here too, and just like the pack raft has that storage compartment, they sell uh, what they call float bags. Um, you know, it's good to have float bags because it takes up the area that could fill up with water if you were to swim. So it makes your boat lighter and fill up with less water if you're taking up that space with an airbag. But just like those, they make them to where they open up. You fill it with all your gear, mm. roll it up, and it's got a little hose where you can blow it up and reinflate it to fit more gear in your boat for extended journeys. Um, let's see. Or right, this is the cockpit rim where that skirt would go. Or, uh, so that way if you flip upside down, you don't fill up with water or um, you can roll back up. Until you swim. Yeah, if you swim, yeah, you're going to fill up with water. <laughs> but it, you've at least got a chance, yeah. you know, to yeah. roll back up. You know, there's a lot of rapids that we run where it's almost guaranteed you're going upside down. And you're just confident that you roll back up at the bottom and celebrate. Or, um, but worst case scenario, you've got an exit strategy. So question. Yeah. Um, float bag versus dry bag. Um, so it sounds like it's the same thing, but it sounds like a float bag you can inflate. Float bag That's shaped. That's the first time I've heard that term. So Yeah, the float bags are shaped. Or uh, this, this foam piece goes all the way down through here. And a dry bag is usually rounded. And you still can fit them back there. I usually put like a med kit in those. But if I'm on an extended trip where I need more gear, your float bags are shaped in like a cone. So it's meant to go all the way to the back of your boat. So you can put small stuff at the bottom of it and work your way up to bigger things and utilize more of that space. So that's and the it's only a safety thing. Huh? And they become a safety thing. They become a flotation device if you need them. Right. They could. Or uh, you know, you would never you would never be in that situation without that flotation on you too. So if you became separated. Or, uh, it's a it's a big deal in white water to make sure you have a properly fitting PFD, and um, yeah, so it, you shouldn't have that issue. If yeah, they they help keep your uh, they help keep your your boat from swamping completely, and it's easier to get it because usually you're trying to get that boat to shore, and and it makes it easier on your team because you never go out by yourself, or uh, it's a safety thing. You at least want to have three people on the water with you. And in theory, that's for having upstream safety, downstream safety, and one person running the feature. Or, um, so that way, if you did swim out of your boat, you, you need to focus on yourself swimming to shore, and your team gets your boat to shore and takes care of emptying it out. And having those float bags is just extra considerate so, of your team. So that's a good point. Is that for white water, or is that for any water? Uh, I think it could be used on any water, but more important in white water. Okay. Yep. So solo trips, flat water, not as much as necessity. Um, I would say if you insist on going out, I would never recommend solo paddling. But if you insist on it, float bags would definitely be helpful if you were to be or come out of your boat. It would make it that that less of weight that you would have to try to swim to shore, or um, having, and you could bring lots of extra things with you because if you had that swim and or you got injured then you'd have all your med kit and snacks and supplies and hopefully your garmin to call for help or, uh, one and one more thing too greg just real quick like we talked about some safety gear and stuff earlier like a white water boat includes helmet you don't need to be wearing a helmet for flat water kayaking and all that yeah. stuff but a white water boat depending on what you're doing you you're going to want to think about some and of that to stuff e as well. even take that a step further if you're skirting or like even if, if you're in a gently flowing shallow stream in a skirted boat then you should still consider wearing a helmet because if you were to flip you don't fall out of your boat you're going to roll all the way upside down and be exposed to whatever's on the bottom mm -hmm. until you come out until you pop that skirt and you come out whereas you know sit in kayaks and sit on top kayaks you're able to just fall out of the boat as it's going over. It's your natural reaction to keep your head above the water. Or, um, whereas these, you're gonna be forced to be exposed to the bottom. So, and I've hit my head a ton, like on rocks and stuff, but you got that helmet, so you just ding right back. Or, um, Easy peasy. You know, shake yeah. it off. 
Well, or, uh, yeah, easy. But it's it's important if you're going to be in a in a in a skirted boat with a back band tightened to where you're going to have to pop that skirt and push out of it because it'll take a few seconds to get out of the boat. Cool. All right, let's rock and roll. Um, we're going to keep this show. All right, so next up, we've all kind of seen this. We won't spend a ton of time on this. I think we all kind of know how this thing plays out. This is this particular board is a Pauhana. I don't know how you pronounce that. I think it's Pauhana. Uh, but this is the big Hawaiian. This is obviously a hard board. So um, we'll we'll talk about an inflatable board too. Very again, I don't want to spend a ton on time on this unless there's questions. But very similar pros and cons, right? Hard board, way more stable. Right, clearly you don't have flex of the inflatable um, uh, board. Um, this is typically, this particular board is just kind of a recreational board. Again, just like kayaks, there's recreational boards, race boards, all that kind of stuff. This board is kind of like that middle of the road where it's good for a little bit of everything. 11 feet, um, looks like, yeah, my notes here, 30, 30 pounds. So again, I think we've got the notes for the inflatable, but you know, uh, 11 feet, 30 pounds, a little bit more cumbersome. Um, this obviously you can't pack up, take with you. This is on the top of a car. Um, you know, for some people, they can kind of throw a little bit of a creek boat like in the back of a car versus, you know, having to throw on top. This, you really, there's no other way to transport this versus on top. So um, my use for this, and this is why it's a perfect boat for me, is, and I don't think I have a picture of it here, but this is what I'll take out and throw one of my kids on there. I've got a seven and a four year old and I'll literally just stand here in the back and they're just sitting up front and they feel like they're, you know, king of their domain, looking out over, you know, looking out over, over the water. So great boat, um, doesn't have a ton of maneuverability. It obviously does have a single fin um, in the back for tracking and some maneuverability, but this is a slow moving, you know, you're not, you're not going fast, you're not making quick turns, you're not doing any of that stuff on this boat, but just a perfect boat for, you know, just a casual, stroll out on the water um, again we talked about a little bit before but this is um, this is my go-to for um, a pfd for this again i don't have the whole you know have the whole you know pfd around my shoulders to avoid um, you know restricting movement this just literally goes around your waist if you happen to fall in pull the tab you can also self-inflate so um, pretty simple uh, the pa this paddle actually breaks down this is a three-piece paddle so this is way more break or packable than the board itself. But, um, you know, I think everybody's kind of familiar with the stand up paddle board. So just kind of a good example of, of kind of your basic run of the mill. I kind of can do a lot of different things paddle board um, just to show you. Yeah, uh, I see a lot of screw holes. Since yeah, it is a hard top. I mean, a solid. Yeah, so these are all attachment points. So similar to some of the other uh, boats that had like bungee cords and stuff like that. You can, there's all kinds of different attachments that come uh, or that you can get with CNA paddle boards. These ones up here in particular are for some sort of bungee system. So if you wanted to, you know, strap a water bottle or something like that, um, those are built for that. It's literally just, there's one here, it's literally just a little screw or a little, uh, a little bolt here. So this just kind of, you can bolt stuff in and out of here. Um, you can do handles, grips, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just, they, there's all kinds of different attachments for this. Most hard boards will have various attachment points on it. Um, kind of depends on the model, the make, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, the, having various attachment points are pretty standard. Um, on the back too, um, you'll see there's actually a hole all the way through that's for locking. So if you want to lock it up, lock it up to a tree or whatever. And then also there's a couple of attachment points back here for, I don't have it on this, but we do have it on the other one but is the leash. So when we pull the uh, inflatable board, similar idea, you can attach a leash to it. The idea is that leash goes around your ankle. If you fall off, you're not getting separated from your, um, from your board. Yeah. Any other questions on that? The big All right. So this is, uh, this is actually not a like traditional touring kayak, but it's like a hybrid. It's like the top end recreational kayak. Oh, they don't all come with peanut butter? Uh, no, I know. No. <laughs> oh, is there peanut butter? Oh, nice. 
<laughs> yeah, the traditional touring kayak, or the only the only real difference, um, a touring kayak is going to be longer, a little more narrow. Uh, it's also going to have a dry storage hatch in the front as well as the back with the bungee systems as well. And they're usually going to come with either a drop down skeg or a foot rudder or for steering the boat. Uh, and they're generally less weight or um, you've got two versions or you've got your uh, composite versions that are either like Kevlar or something really lightweight and fast. Um, but those are going to be more fragile. So they're yes. very specific environments. Or, uh, and the other ones are going to be made with that high impact plastic. So they're a little heavier. Um, but if you know that you've got kind of a mixed trip with a lot of flat water, but still some shallow shoaly areas, then those would be the, the top choice for that one. And that's what this is. All right, well, this one is, uh, this is or the same company would make those touring kayaks, or the ones that I'm explaining are both like the same design, or uh, they're a little longer. This is a recreational kayak, but it's right there bordering that touring version. It's just missing a little bit of length, a little bit more narrow, or, um, you know, I can, only, I can show you so some many pictures. Boats, there's only so many boats we could fit in this room here, Brian. Yeah. We got to... <laughs> or, um, and, and they're, they're generally, or, uh, you know, this one, this one right here, it's, it's the Wilderness Systems Pongo. And, you know, this one is going to be a little cheaper than those touring kayaks. It still has some different storage compartments inside of it. Or, uh, I don't even know if this one's going to work for me. Well, and that's removable too, right? Yeah, you can take this off, or this is a different little system. Um, and then you've got your, your you know, storage compartment, dry storage compartment in the back. And there's these systems, these foam blocks that separate it. So even if you were to, you know, flip over, fill up your boat with water, whatever you had in that back hatch, uh, it's the same, the same way in the front hatch on a true touring kayak. So that's not a separate compartment. There's just a foam block that separates it. Yeah, it's a sealed, or this one, sometimes there'll be composite blocks, or depending on which, or, you know, there'll be like actual separate compartments or chambers in your boat. Or, um, oh, there's no telling what's in there. Yeah, we don't, we don't want to show that. Universe. Keep that camera over there. You don't want to see that. We'll, we'll talk about that off camera. There we go. Hey, this isn't my boat. This isn't my <laughs> boat, all right? I don't know what's in here. What goes with the peanut butter? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. But, you know, they're, they're also, they have adjustable foot pegs inside of them. They have the, the seats adjustable to where you can also, like, raise the legs or the platforms. You can raise your seat. You can move it forwards or backwards, a cup holder. Or, uh, so, you know, in the bungee system, these are still built for, like, if you wanted to do an overnight experience or something like that. And they're going to be a little shorter. So depending on your, your space that you have to store the boats, you know, maybe one of these types of recreational kayaks, you know, this is going to at least be like the step above or um, what you would see like the recreational racks at your normal like retail store, mm -hmm. unless it's a specialty store. So you, front end of this has a compartment or does not? Uh, this one does not. So that's like that's like the the skeg or the rudder and that front storage compartment is really the the main differences in a true touring kayak versus this kayak. Or, um, and that that front storage would be a separate compartment, right? So it's yeah. kind of like that dry uh -huh. storage. Yeah, yeah, it's a and those are those are great too for like especially those extended trips. Or I think you were in one. Well, that's why. Yeah, yeah, I went. I went back to it here on this. Uh, this pic, the yellow boat. Yeah. That so. was we. That that was absolutely a touring boat because it had it had that drop down skag and yeah. then it had the two compartments on the front yeah. and the back. Yeah. And then the the boats that me and Brandon were in, those are whitewater hybrid. Like yeah. uh, they have dry storage compartments in the back. They're called crossover kayaks. So Stinger XPs were the boats that were designed for doing Grand Canyon trips mm. where you've got big white water, you still want that drop down skeg for tracking in the flat water and, you need storage. and you've got storage mm -hmm. to, to bring all your gear with you. That's what you both had? Yeah, we cool. both had stingers on that So, trip. So we talk a lot about storage and these separate compartments, why we have this up here. So I'm in this boat and I get a crack underneath my seat. I still have buoyancy between the front and the back as correct. well, correct? Yeah. So I'm taking on water in the center, and it's something we really haven't talked about yet, but it may be coming. I'm still going to have flotation, right? Yeah, you've still at least, it's almost like you have float bags on both right. sides of your boat. 
And most of the time on a touring kayak trip, you'll see people on these bungee cords, they'll slide a bilge pump or like a hand pump bilge pump in the boat. And that's for if you're in a splashy environment, it starts raining on you or you swamp. Then Watery you, trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Then you've at least got an option, like even while you're paddling down the river to go ahead and pump water out of your yeah, boat yeah. or a sponge. I didn't see that safety thing here, that bilge pump. You know, is that something more of a flat water requirement or? Yeah, I would say touring, recreational, because the whitewater kayaks are super easy to empty. Or, um, and most boats are also still come with drain plugs. I don't know if this one does, probably does. But our boats have drain plugs on the bottom of them, and it's also easy, easy to like just flip the boat upside down. Or if you can get the nose or the tail That's of it. a boat up on shore, and you stand down in the water, and just flip it upside down, and then pick it up, all the water falls out of it. Or um, and there's methods you can use even in open water as long as you're traveling with people, or to still use their boats as the way to empty your boat in mm. open water. And we teach those in classes too. We we teach. Uh, like American Canoe or American Canoe Association courses to teach people what to do in environments like that. Bringing back the Boy Scout memory. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I threw a lot of questions in there. I, I love questions. Just, you're you're yeah. good. That's what this is all about. No, that's perfect. Oh yeah. So wait, this is removable? You said it is. Is that is that common on a touring boat, or is that just know. kind of this model? Uh, I think it's it's probably on a few different models. Okay. Or I know it's a pretty common thing. Or, uh, what's you know, what, like a, what's the reasoning behind that? Like, what's um, the application? Additional for? attachment while you're cruising down the river. You've got or your cup holders here, or your your Nalgene, your coffee cup, or and you open this. You throw a few snacks in there. You can throw like you your garment or something. So really cool. I have one of these yeah. on my boat, and um, it's um, you know I keep you know I've got a little bungee system in there. I can you know, drop my sunblock in one side of it, yeah. you know, the little compartment on the front, I've got a couple snacks in if I want to take my Easy sunblock access. off. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's just storage, you yeah. know. It's, makes it to where everything you would there. normally have to put in there is now right in yep. front of you. Cool. So. And you know, the other thing I like about it too is it shades half my legs, right? Yeah, we yes. talked earlier about the open <laughs> top. This is a sport top. If that wasn't on there, you'd be completely exposed. exposed. Yeah. And at least only your knees are exposed. And that's right. It's less sunblock, right? Yeah. Cool. All right, sweet. I think we got one more board. So again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because I think this, this is a pretty obvious one, the pro, con, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this particular board is the uh, Aquaglide Cascade. Um, they have different lengths. This, this one is the 10-foot, um, but they have a 11-foot and... I think they might just have a 10 foot and 11 foot. Um, so pro and con, right? Same thing. And there's all the attachment points that we talked about on the Pauana, right? You've got your bungee straps here. This is, this is kind of a universal attachment thing. So they have all kinds of, it's a, you can get attachment that is a cup holder, that is, you know, an iPhone holder, a GoPro, I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's basically like, this is one of the primary areas that you want because it's easy access. So as you're paddling, you're probably standing right around here. Easy access is right here. So if it is, you know, if you want the water or whatever it is, that's just, that's a primary spot for easy access to grab. So they have all kinds of different attachments that you can buy depending on what you're wanting to do with it. Um, but you also have some attachment points here. Um, the one thing, one thing I'll say on this, so this is specific to Aquaglide and I, you know, I'm more familiar with that brand than, than some others, but the, um, this is kind of surprising me. I don't know the science behind it, but the 10 foot board, this particular board, the weight limit, the spec weight limit is 180 pounds, which doesn't seem like a lot. The 11 foot board is 280 pounds. So again, I don't, I, I don't personally understand the science behind the hundred pound capacity nice. increase. Yeah. But, um, and I'm, like I said, I'm 210 or so. I've been on this board. It's fine. Um, I think, there, yeah, on the, on the slide, we've got a, uh, a picture with my, the four-year-old jumped on this with me, and, and we, were, we, were, um, we were totally fine on it. Obviously, it's not near as stable as a hardboard, right? So again, there's your, your, your primary pro and con is a hardboard is way more stable. It doesn't have any of that flex, or it doesn't have near as much of the flex as an inflatable board does. I mean, this is, we didn't fully, fully inflate this, but you can see even that, you know, there's a couple inch flex. If, if you put it under under pressure that you can kind of feel. So 
pro and con is this thing literally packs up into it. It comes with a backpack. You throw the pump, the paddle, the board, everything into the backpack, and you can literally just walk around with the backpack. The way less stable, but it's way more easy to transport. This, obviously, again, as we said, you have to throw it on top of the car. You have all kinds of other stuff to worry about. So there's no right or wrong answer. It really just depends on what, you know, how you're going to use it and, uh, and what you find important. If, if smaller storage is important, then a stand-up paddleboard is, is, is obviously your go-to. If, you know, you've got plenty of space and you don't worry about, you're not worried about chucking on top of the car, hardboard's probably the, probably the move. This is that leash I was talking about, too. I don't have this on my hardboard, but... Um, same idea. It's just What's that? So <laughs> the, this this PFD is what they wear. So they can they can follow. They'll figure it out. That's called that's called uh, real world education. That's what that's called. <laughs> so just let me throw this out there. Yeah. In the, you know, and this is you know Aqua Glide we're talking about, and, and I get that um, in the market out there, right? So I can you know online order a stand up paddleboard for a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm versus I can go into a retailer yeah. or even online and order one for 900 bucks, yep. right? So what, you know, other than a foot in length that's going to give me 100 more pounds of, what, what am I getting? Why do I not want to buy as a beginner stand-up paddle board that $100 board? Because that's really enticing, you know, yeah. the budget's yeah. a big thing these days. But why do I want to buy that board versus buying, I don't know what this one retails for, let's just I'm say sure. it's 600 yeah. bucks or something. Uh -huh. You know, what you may or may not know these answers, but what am I getting in a difference? Am I getting a quality difference that... Definitely. And, and you may no, yeah, so or it usually so. comes down to quality or special features or things that have, you know, maybe even the, the material that they, that they use for the boards sure. or... Uh, maybe even the warranty that comes with it. You know, what's what's what what's covered with it? Yeah. I, I recently, so, kayaking, recently found a paddleboard washed up on the shore. So that's what I was going to say. And, so and, and, and it was all folded up, nice and neat, but the scene when was got blown it back out. to see what was going on with it. Why somebody left it there? It had a completely blown out yeah. seam on it. Yeah. And and it was just just for the viewers to you know. So when they're thinking about that, they're like, why do I want to spend 900 bucks on board, 800 bucks on board? I mean, I can't imagine being in the middle of a lake. In a seam block. And, 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 yeah. and I mean, and I'm paddling along, I'm having a happy day, and the next thing I know, I this big explosion, uh -huh. and now, I'm, you know, hopefully I have my PFD closer with me or on me, that now i got to swim back to shore because yeah. this thing blew a seam on it. So, with, with that, I bet you I know what happened to, or some, something that's really simple to know, or uh, that a lot of people may not know, or a lot of people don't read the, the care and maintenance or things that go with it. But if you inflate this board to its full PSI and then you leave it on the shore, the or, sun. Uh, it's sun. the sun, the heat causes it to expand, and that's like the main reason like the seams may blow out. Or so if you know you're going to be on shore or, uh, you know, purge your, or if you know it's a really hot day, you can purge the valve a little bit or uh, like to take a little bit of that air out. Or also keep in mind when the sun goes down, it's going to get squishy. So you need to have your pump with you to reinflate it. Yeah. Or, so that's where the mini pump comes in. Here. That's right. So, yeah, a couple. And that's where you can throw, the, you know, throw a, a mini pump on the or a, even a floor pump on the on the uh, bungee. So a couple things. I just looked up the QR code. This this particular board is 750, and again, I'm not. I don't know all the specs of it. But what's um, there's drop stitching and all this. So all these little dimples and all this stuff is basically like called drop stitching. And so my assumption is I don't know this, but my assumption. You see how tight all these are. That's basically like at each dimple. There's a connection point to the bottom. Well, yeah, so on the cheap, have that. I think exactly. But my but my point is a cheaper one, it'd be way further apart, oh. right? So it's just not as you know, it's just not as tight. The other thing is, and ironically, and I know you're not asking this question because of where we are, but literally, think about what we're talking about here. We're in recover. This this place makes environmentally friendly, sustainable shirts that are more expensive than your cheap mash produced thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So that hundred dollar sup on Amazon is your cheap mash produced whatever that's gonna end up with a blown seam. Right. 
So it depends, like, where do you want to spend your dollar, right? Again, we're not going to, we don't want to turn this into a recovery thing, but like, that's a good, that's a perfect example. It's fast fashion with just mass produced shirts is the same thing as that hundred dollar board. That's just, you know, fast fitness. I just made that term up, but like, it's the same idea. Like, you can get whatever for super cheap, but you kind of get what you pay for. Right. Well, and, and, and I wanted that out and there. I, and I don't know what that word was, but I bet you that's what it was. For, for the recording, I wanted that out there for our, yeah. the viewers to yeah. know that, because they're going to have that question. Yep. Like, why don't I just buy this? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, you can go buy. Four, it's just like anything else. It's, it's, it's the car, right? It's like, what do you want to spend on a car? We talk about shoe, the different styles well, of shoes. It's, it's, the, it's, it's like, the bike. It's the shoe. It's the running vest. It's the gear in mm -hmm. general. It's yeah. the same thing across yeah. the board. How long I, do you want it to last? I will, I will say this. I'm the cheapest dude in the world. Like, my wife will. Pretty close. Yeah. She'll, she'll tell you that. She'll <laughs> love you if you. Anyway. Um, I love spending significant money on good quality gear because I did, that's what I like to spend my money on. Sure. Some people like to go out to dinner and whatever. I like to spend on good gear because I, I want my gear to take care of me while I'm out there. If I'm out there in the lake, I don't want to have to worry about, all right, is this seam going to blow? Right. Or if I hit that rock in a kayak and all of a sudden the plastic they use is way cheaper and all of a sudden I'm stranded out here in the middle of nowhere. Like I, that's my personal opinion, but I'm totally okay spending money where it's important to me. And that is in, in our world and gear world is, is yeah, buying good quality gear. It's value per experience. 100%. If you're going someplace and you're going there for today and oh, I forgot a camp chair, you go to Harris Teeter, you buy a $10 camp chair. Yeah. It's one use. Yeah. It's ten dollars. It's done. Yeah. yeah. Or you go to a respectable outdoor retailer mm -hmm. and you get a quality camp chair yep. that costs more. Yeah, that, that warranty is probably uses. not as good for that it's cheap. <laughs> it's kind of what Greg said. Like what? that's huge. Right? Three years later and a hundred experiences later, yeah. you st so you're at like much less dollar per experience. Yep. Yeah. Dollar per adventure. It's funny you mentioned camp chair because just this uh, this river survey that we did, or uh, we had this. You know, we've got our. You know, they're not super expensive, but sixty dollar camp chairs, nice, compact. And one of our buddies had forgot his and bought this ten dollar chair. And day <laughs> five, he fell through it <laughs> or on our trip because you know it was wet and then dry and then yeah. wet and then oh, dry yeah. on the back of his boat. And then day five, he just fell right oh, through the no. chair so you know that's a perfect Ex example. exhibit a right there yeah. literally a day ago yeah and we've had our camp chairs for years so hundreds <laughs> of experiences for 60 bucks versus five days with 10 bucks yeah, it's, it's that's funny and again it's what you're looking for if you're going yeah. someplace for the weekend sure maybe you buy the hundred dollar paddleboard yeah. And yeah. then it's designed to be thrown away because it's not yeah. going to make it through dry storage for all the, year. That that board that you found, I'm making, I'm speculating here, but that board you found was probably someone who went and got it at whatever, super cheap. Oh, it, used it, it once or twice. Looking at researching yeah. it after I found it, I did, yeah. Like when I initially found it, I didn't know what was wrong with it. Why is this laying here? Yeah. It was trash at that point. So let's get it off the beach and let's, yeah. you know, let's do the right thing when I'm out and yeah. clean it up. And then when I got back and unrolled it and went, oh, it's got a blown seam. And yeah. it's just the thought process of, oh yeah, this is a hundred dollar board. That's a great example of why I would want to spend more on a yeah. quality board. Yeah. And, and you know, with manufacturing so cheap around the world and all these, all these products we can get so cheap, why get the cheap stuff when it's your yeah. life? You know? Well, that's, 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 yeah, I mean, that's consumerism. People can buy whatever they want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, but it's, you know, when we're looking at inflatable stuff, yeah. it's, you know, because people looking online and doing research, they're going to go, you know, you just start researching anything and you're yeah. going to see the cheaper stuff. Yeah. First, so. yeah. All right. Well, we're getting we're we're a little over time here, so um, I want to get uh, Brian. If you can get one more shot, I'm going to deflate this just to kind of show you. I know we did that for the um, uh, pack raft. Um, we'll throw. I mean, we can kind of hang out and do a, a Q and A. This may be a nice shot here at the end of the uh, for the for the viewers at home. But nice and loud blast. Yeah. Ready? All right. So all I'm going to do is here. You ready? Holy lord. There we go.
We'll roll that sucker up and we'll uh, rock and roll out of here. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hopefully you've learned a couple things from today's Recreation 101 session. Uh, before we sign off, we are here at Recover HQ with Bill Johnson of Recover. Um, huge thanks once again for them to, uh, to support this whole series, as well as give you the tools, knowledge, and understanding to get out and enjoy nature in different ways. Yeah, well, first off, thank you for, for putting this on uh, in Human Power Movement. But uh, thank, thanks to all of you who, who mm -hmm. participated in, uh, and took part in Outdoor Rack 101. Um, being the title sponsor is really important to us as a brand. Um, you know, as we talk a lot about sustainability, we really think of it as really the constant pursuit to do better. Mm -hmm. We're always trying to improve yeah. our systems, the way we do things, and just give more people access and exposure to, yeah. to do things the right way. And we yep. feel like Outdoor Rec 101 really speaks to that. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited for, for all these new outdoor enthusiasts who've, uh, who've been completed the, the class and, uh, and look forward to, to seeing you guys out there. Um, so, so thanks again for putting it on yep. and, and thanks to all of you for participating.